Okay. okay. So welcome to the ninth webinar of the ISG. This time we talk about sarcoidosis. Um, I think you know, if this is not the first time that you participate, there are two ways to follow these webinars. One is to see this live. You are doing this in the moment. The other one is to see this on demand. If you want to see this on demand, you simply go to the registration, scroll down, and from there, at the end, you will see all the YouTube videos from one to eight. Number nine will be online then next week. If you're following, following live, then after the webinar, you will receive a questionnaire from the organizers. And please send this questionnaire back. We need this. And you will get for this one your documents of participation and your CME points. Um, let me quickly announce probably something. I will repeat that at the end because there's also always some kind of fluctuation. We are planning on October 16, an additional webinar, which will cover COVID-19 and the ocular situation. Uh, we are still in the preparation of to get all the speakers together. And this will be shown up then also on our uh, website, and I will announce it definitely then uh, for uh, our next webinar, which will be first Saturday again in October as planned. One more point, please ask your question and answer, use your question and answer button here at the end of your screen. Don't use a chat. Chat is only for us, for, uh, con for our contacts. For question and answers, we will definitely try to answer all your questions, um, probably after the meeting, sometimes in between. So dear speakers, whenever you have time, check your question and answers. They are probably only for you and it would be nice if you can answer them. Okay, then I would like to give to Vishali. Can you start this meeting? Thank you, Manfred. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being here with us for a very, very important webinar, which is important for the world across because like we are in a country where we are seeing a lot of tuberculosis and then there are countries where there is a lot of sarcoidosis and we are always confused between the two. So passing on to our host and the person who's done everything for this meeting, Justin Smith, who will take it forward from now. Justin, are you there? Perfect. Thank you, Justin, for being there. Okay, so thank you very much, Vishali. Um, and we just want to thank uh, Professor Ziohut. Professor Gupta and Professor DeSmet for organizing this great webinar series, uh, ISG Goes Virtual. And it, it's a real pleasure to run this session on ocular sarcoidosis. And Vishali was very kind. Actually, it, it wasn't me that solely organized this. Um, I'm very grateful to co-organizers, uh, Professor Manabu Mochizushi, who you can see on the screen as well, and Professor Kwan Huing, who you also can see on the screen. And they'll be talking a little bit later in the session. So let me first share my slides. I'm gonna do a very short introduction. And I believe you can all see those slides now. So the webinar number nine on ocular sarcoidosis, current concepts, diagnosis and management. And I just wanna say thank you to all of you. I think there's over 150 people here now from all around the world, all different time zones. I'm coming to you from Australia where it's very late at night which um, is why I may not be here at the end of the webinar, but I'm very glad to be, um, to be introducing it. So ocular sarcoidosis is a condition that's very interesting to ophthalmologists, intriguing really. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, ocular sarcoidosis is a common manifestation for patients who have systemic sarcoidosis. It can be the major manifestation. It can develop without any systemic involvement. When you talk about patients with ocular sarcoidosis, most of those patients will uh, have uveitis. Um, and in fact, it's the, the presenting complaint in 
well over half of people who present with ocular sarcoidosis and uveitis. So uveitis is, the, is commonly the presenting complaint. Um, it, um, some of those patients will go on to develop systemic disease soon after. Some will have systemic disease at presentation, but it won't be recognized. Uh, and sarcoidosis is often a misdiagnosis. It can be a misdiagnosis too. It can be confused with the granulomatous infections, which uh, Professor Gupta just mentioned, uh, such as tuberculosis. And another common um, uh, confusing point is uh, vitreo retinal lymphoma. So there's a lot of activity in this space amongst uveitis specialists. The Global Ocular Inflammation Workshops has a special workshop just on ocular, ocular sarcoidosis and Manabu Mochizushi has been instrumental in pushing this forward. And you can see that we've had a couple of papers very recently, one on the diagnostic criteria and one on management recommendations. And those are gonna be uh, discussed in this webinar. Uh, also the uh, Sun, group uh, have recently published classification criteria for sarcoidosis associated uveitis. So that's a project that's been going on for well over 10 years. And then finally, as has been alluded to already, um, sarcoidosis is really interesting and intriguing to ophthalmologists because of this um, relationship with tuberculosis, um, which will, will be explored here in the webinar. And uh, Professor Agarwal is going to talk about that in particular. So here you are, we, uh, we have a really nice series of talks lined up for you this evening. There are um, seven talks plus a section of case presentations. And then finally, um, uh, Professor Zierhut's going to talk to us or chair a session on controversies. So welcome everyone. And I'm very pleased to turn this over to our next speaker, uh, on Min Khan, who's going to talk about sarcoidosis as a systemic disease. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us tonight, but he has recorded a, a very nice talk, which, uh, which we'll all be able to enjoy now. Good day to all of you in this webinar for the International Uveitis Study Group. I'm On Min Khan. I'm a professor of respiratory medicine at St. Mary's Hospital in Imperial College. And um, I'm going to hopefully give you an overview of what sarcoidosis represents in terms of a systemic disease rather than necessarily just, for instance, pulmonary disease, nor for that matter, um, just limited to the organ of interest today, which is obviously the ocular compartment. So all of you are well aware this is a granulomatous inflammatory condition um, with some immunological trademarks and some of these include the elevation of the CD4, CD8 ratio, as well as the cutaneous energy. Most of you are also aware that we find these patients asymptomatic and really our radiological findings um, by coincidence as investigations are being carried out for other matters. The incidence does vary um, globally and certainly in Europe, this even has a north to south divide within itself. There's a female preponderance and increased prevalence uh, in Black Asians and the Irish, um, certainly in Western practice. Interesting uh, that it does have less prevalence in smokers. And just to underscore this issue about it being systemic disease, we note that there is um, an increase in mortality. So it's certainly not just a benign granulomatous inflammatory condition. The etiology of sarcoidosis remains a mystery, and there are many putative agents thought to initiate this inflammatory process. However, the general principle appears to be that it's triggered by a combination of genetic factors, as well as environmental exposure and this may be more than one etiological agent and finally in the background of a dysregulated exaggerated th1 immune response to illustrate the systemic nature of sarcoidosis there are several agents also associated with triggering a sarcoid like reaction and you see this is really quite varied in terms of cytokines anti-cytokine therapies checkpoint inhibitors and even antiretrovirals. Just to reiterate that there is a mortality difference between the general population 
and a sarcoidosis population. On top of that, if you were severe enough to be treated, that prognosis is similarly worse. This is in a Swedish um, population-based cohort study. Again, underlining that this is not a benign disease in some. This slide is the one that hopefully you will remember, which is the organ systems involved and also the prevalence of organ involvement per system. The lung is the commonest, then followed by the skin. And obviously today's talk will major around the ocular phenotypes. However, it's important to also look at the last two, which are that of the nervous system and heart, which um, carry quite substantive morbidity and also certainly in terms of the cardiac side, a very dangerous phenotype that needs aggressively treating. So, sarcoidosis is generally divided into the acute and chronic manifestations. And again, uh, um, you, many of you will have heard of Lofgren syndrome and Hereford Waldenstrom syndrome. And with Lofgren's, this is the classic bilateral hyalolymphadenopathy, erythematosum, but also an arthritis, arthralgia, and an anterior uveitis, whereas the Hereford Waldstrom syndrome is the classic uveoprotid fever and facial nerve palsy. More commonly, we have the insidious onset phenotype, and you will recall that we do find these cases coincidentally by merely performing chest x-rays or even CT scans for unrelated matters. Then the more progressive um, phenotype would be those who start developing dyspnea, non-productive cough in general, then followed by malaise and weight loss. The radiology staging I will demonstrate to you in a minute um, for revision. And obviously, if it's progressive, um, the respiratory symptoms then follow suit. The classical chest radiograph will either show bilateral hyaluronephalinopathy or an infiltrate or both. And differentials include that of malignancy, lymphoma, as well as tuberculosis more globally. CT scan adds a whole different level of detail, which again gives us specific classical phenotypes. Blood work may show raised inflammatory markers, and obviously there may be hypercalcemia as well as the raised gamma globulin. And liver function tests, have, as I've discussed before, in terms of getting a diagnosis, we will generally try to biopsy a node by endobronchial ultrasound or even by transbronchial biopsy of the parenchyma, which carries a higher risk. If you were to do a lavage, that may show a lymphocytic picture and raise CD4 to 8 ratio. Lung function can be mixed because some people with endobronchial sarcoidosis do actually have airway obstruction in addition to a restrictive picture. This test, the climb test, is now, uh, in fact, not being used any further. Some of you may have heard of this. This was suspension of spleens of people with uh, active disease previously and um, useful when it was available, but due to uh, concerns around slow virus, this is obviously no longer an accepted mode of testing. The traditional gallium scan um, used to be probably our radionuclide examination of choice, but um, more units are now uh, having PET scans available, and these I think are more commonly used when you need a second line investigation. So I've given you an overview of the general diagnostic pathway, as I've said. In terms of the specific radiology, hyla adenopathy, normally bilateral and symmetrical, with upper zone or diffuse infiltrates, there are generally paralymphatic nodules, parabronchial thickening, classical bronchovascular bundle um, nodularity. And if you were to use the other modalities, um, you may obviously see adenopathy, but also an MRI gadolinium enhancement. Chest x-rays or CT may show you cysts and punched out lesions, as I've demonstrated before. And in terms of target organs, the uh, cardiac 
disease phenotype is best um, demonstrated by both MRI as well as PET scan. The classic uveoprotid fever, protid uptake would be by gallium and PET. And obviously multiple modalities can see nodules in the liver or spleen as well as the bone. This slide illustrates the classical non caseating granulomas in panel A. But panel B illustrates, for instance, chronic hypersensitivity, and panel C illustrates a caseating necrotic granulomatous inflammatory change, this time from histoplasma, but globally, clearly, tuberculosis is a key differential diagnosis. This slide illustrates the multiple causes of granulomas in several diseases as a reminder that sarcoidosis is a diagnosis of exclusion and really relies on ruling out other diseases and then followed by understanding the classical phenotypes associated with sarcoidosis. This slide is to signpost the American Clinical Practice document issued by the American Thoracic Society last year just to understand the tests panel and also the pathway. So here's an illustration of the symmetrical nature of mediastinal nodes in sarcoidosis, as well as this so-called eggshell calcification. And this is a classical gallium scan showing the protid uptake as well as the lacrimal gland uptake. And you can see down below the mediastinal nodes. And again, here they talk about the pathological features and some potential um, clues as to whether other diseases are in fact causing the granulomas. So just a reminder of the plain chest radiology phenotypes we would recognize and define people by zero, obviously normal chest radiograph. Um, Stage one would be bilateral hyalur adenopathy only. Stage two, bilateral hyalur adenopathy with parenchymal infiltration. Stage three, um, you may just get infiltrates without nodes on the plain film. And four would be fibrotic changes. And these, in terms of gradation, do correspond to um, the likelihood of spontaneous resolution and worsen prognosis in terms of the higher grades. This nice review by Grunwald et al. in the Nature Reviews shows beautiful pictures of a endobronchial mucosal um, thickening that is very characteristic of endobronchial sarcoid. If you biopsy this with a biopsy forceps, you'll find beautiful examples of non caseating granulomas. B is this typical reddish discoloration around the earlobe. C is a sarcoidosis dactylitis, D lupus perneo, E is a cardiac MRI image showing a coronary artery being highlighted as inflamed um, in terms of the gadolinium uptake. And uh, F is typical bone cyst seen with dactylitis, G is a PET scan showing muscular uh, involvement and H uh, once seen never forgotten these are skin lesions over tattoo marks and again as you're aware it has a predilection for going for scars even surgical ones and finally I is an MRI showing an inflammatory lesion just by the optic chiasma So here's a list again of the extrathoracic sarcoidosis sites, which are to underline the systemic presentations and the skin I've shown you examples of. We're going to talk comprehensively about the ocular phenotypes today. I've shown you examples of uh, bony cysts and arthralgia and cardiac disease. We'll just concentrate on in a few minutes. Central nervous system, very important. Again, I will concentrate at the end. But importantly, the metabolic um, issue of activation of um, hydroxylated vitamin D results in hypercalcemia and in the more advanced phenotypes, renal calculi, as well as acute kidney injury with the nephropathy. The other general features are really um, common and you will have many patients describe this fatigue 
which is really quite overwhelming in some cases. Here are some examples of the skin manifestations. This is lupus pernio, and this is someone again with skin lesions and a dactylitis. This is someone with erythema nodosum. And here are several MRIs um, showing you cerebral lesions, and you can see edema as well as enhancement. And even in some cases, leptomeningeal enhancement, particularly in this case. And this is a typical cardiac MRI showing uh, evidence of inflammatory change. And here is a PET cardiac study showing active cardiac sarcoidosis. And PET, again, is quite useful in terms of the general um, review of how active things are. And this is uh, a case pre and post treatment. And you'll see the, the adenopathy, cardiac imaging, and this nice tomogram showing you the overall reduction in activity. So from a cardiac point of view, this can be uh, life-threatening and really um, result even in sudden death. And therefore, it's important just to be aware echocardiography here is really of um, low utility and you really need to go either to cardio MRI or PET. Um, and we will generally use both these modalities in our patients. So I'm going to stop there and I hope I've given you an overview of systemic disease. And I'm sure we will enjoy the discussion a bit later on. Thank you. Thank you, Anmin. That was very, very informative talk for all of us who really sometimes get confused as to how to diagnose systemic type of sarcoidosis. Uh, thank you, Anmin, for being there and your life as well. And thank you for answering the questions. With this, we move on to our second speaker, none other than Manabu Mochisuki. I don't have to introduce him as everybody knows him. He is the one who is been giving us the criteria for diagnosing ocular sarcoidosis. Over to you, Manabu, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Manabu, can you share your screen and unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Manabu, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this VVIT's webinar and giving me an opportunity to talk on revised IWOS criteria for the diagnosis of ocular sarcoidosis. IWOS stands for International Workshop on Ocular Sarcoidosis. I have no uh, conflict of interest to disclose. Sarcoidosis is a multi-system chronic inflammatory disease of unknown etiology affecting the lung, skin, lymph nodes, eye, heart, liver, and many other organs. 30 to 60% of patients with sarcoidosis develop various ocular diseases, in particular uveitis. Therefore, the disease is a major cause of uveitis across the world. In Japan, sarcoidosis is a leading cause of uveitis, consisting of 10 to 13 percent of whole uveitis. This figure illustrates anatomical classification of uveitis, that is, anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, and posterior uveitis, depending upon where the major site of inflammation locates in the eye. Distinguished features of uveitis in sarcoidosis are granulomatous changes in these intraocular tissues as shown in the next few slides. 
These pictures are Orianomatous anterior uveitis in sarcoidosis patients. In addition to cells and flares in the anterior chamber, mutton fat keratic precipitates with medium to large size or kepe nodules at papillary margin or busaka nodules in iris stroma or small white nodules at the trabecular meshwork and tent-shaped peripheral anterior synechia are typical manifestations of anterior granulomatous anterior uveitis in sarcoidosis. These are granulomatous intermediate uveitis in sarcoidosis patients showing snowball or string of, string of pearls like vitreous opacities. And these pictures are granulomatous posterior uveitis in sarcoidosis patients showing multiple peripheral chorioretinal white regions as shown here, nodular or segmental periflevitis with or without candlelux dripping, optic disc nodules, and solitary colloidal granuloma, and macro aneurysm in an inflamed eye. A gold standard of diagnosis for sarcoidosis is histopathological proof of non casing non cachetting granuloma in biopsy samples, such as the lung or the skin. However, biopsy of intraocular tissues, such as the retina or the iris, is not commonly performed due to its high risk for vision. Therefore, diagnosis of ocular sarcoidosis is made by either biopsy of non-ocular tissues, like the lung or the skin, or combination of intraocular clinical science and systemic laboratory investigations. And such efforts were made in the first IWOS meeting in, back in 2006, and the international criteria for the diagnosis of ocular sarcoidosis were established. The criteria consists of seven intraocular signs, which I showed you before, and five systemic tests are shown here, and four categories of ocular sarcoidosis, definite, presumed, probable, and possible ocular sarcoidosis, depending on the biopsy results, or presence of bilateral heral lymphadenopathy, or combination of intraocular clinical signs and systemic laboratory investigations. Then this criteria was validated by two, in, uh, two independent uh, studies. One uh, single center study in Japan and the other an um, international multi-center study with more than 800 UVITIS patients from 12 countries. Then these validation studies concluded that there is diagnostic usefulness in some parts, but some systemic investigations, such as abnormal liver enzymes are insufficient for international cohort of patients. And it was suggested to add normal laboratory tests and use advanced statistical method to develop generalizable classification system. And the device IWS criteria were established by a consensus workshop with a two-step process. Step one was a questionnaire survey circulated and voted by 30 international UVITIS experts and items with 75% support were taken as a IWS consensus agreement and items with less than 50% support had consensus disagreement and items with 50 to 75% support were subjected to step two, 
which was a panel discussion by 38 UVIDS experts. And items with two third majority support were taken as consensus agreement. Now I'd like to show you the conclusion of the revised IWS criteria. The first is differential diagnosis. That is, other causes of granulomatous uveitis must be ruled out. The second is seven intraocular clinical signs, which were exactly the same as I mentioned before. That is, granulomatous anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, and posterior uveitis, and bilaterality. The third is eight systemic investigations, that is bilateral heral lymphadenopathy on chest X-ray or CT scan, negative tuberculin skin test or interferon gamma release assay, elevated serum angiotensin converting enzyme, elevated serum lysozyme, or elevated CD4, CD8 ratio in bronch alveolar lavage fluid, the abnormal Gaim Shinchgram or 18F PET scan, and lymphopenia less than 1000, and lastly, lung parenchymal changes consistent to sarcoidosis determined by pulmonologists or radiologists. And the last is diagnostic criteria consisting of now three categories that is, definite presumed and probable ocular sarcoidosis. Definite OS is supported by biopsy with compatible uveitis. Presumed OS is not supported by biopsy, but BHL, bilateral heral lymphadenopathy, and two intraocular signs are present. And probable OS is not supported by biopsy and bilateral heral lymphadenopathy is absent. But three intraocular signs and two systemic investigations are present. Now, these revised criteria were validated by a retrospective single center study in Japan with 51 biopsy proven sarcoidosis patients with uveitis and 272 control uveitis, including 95 idiopathic granulomatous uveitis. All 51 biopsy-proven sarcoidosis patients with uveitis were classified as definite ocular sarcoidosis. And among 272 control uveitis patients, 16 patients were classified as presumed ocular sarcoidosis because bilateral heral lymphadenopathy and two or more intraocular signs were present. Another three control patients were classified as probable ocular sarcoidosis because BHL was absent, but three or more intraocular signs and two or more systemic investigations were present. Then the sensitivity and specificity of the revised criteria were calculated to be 1.0 and 0.93 respectively, and positive predictive value and negative predictive value of the revised criteria were calculated to be 0.728 and 1.0 respectively. These are diagnostic parameters of the seven intraocular clinical signs. As shown here, all the seven intraocular signs were significantly more in ocular sarcoidosis patients than in non-OS patients. Positive predictive value uh, of uh, the seven uh, intraocular signs varies from 0 .7, uh, 0.33 and 0.71, uh, 71. But positive, uh, negative predictive value 
were considerably high in all seven intracranial uh, clinical signs. And these are diagnostic parameters of the eight systemic investigations. Bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy had extremely high values of positive predictive value, PPV, and negative predictive value. None of the other systemic uh, investigation has such high PPV and NPV, indicating that bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is highly diagnostic for sarcoidosis. Bronc alveolar lavage fluid test was performed only in three patients of non ocular sarcoidosis patients, and therefore, comparative analysis was not possible. All other system investigations, except for lymphopenia, were significantly more in OS patients than in non OS diabetes patients. And lymphopenia appears to be less diagnostic than other uh, systemic investigations, at least for Japanese patients. In summary, device IWS criteria for the diagnosis of ocular sarcoidosis consists of seven intraocular signs and eight systemic investigations and three categories, that is definite, presumed, probable ocular sarcoidosis, depending on the biopsy results and the presence of the uh, bilateral lymphadenopathy and clinical ocular signs or system investigations. The validation study in Japan revealed the revised criteria appears to be useful, but validations in many other countries must be uh, performed. Very recently, classification criteria for sarcoidosis associated diabetes was reported in American Journal of Sarmoji by a Sun Working Group. Unique and updated methodologies were applied to develop the criteria, that is, case collection across the world, case selection typical for sarcoidosis, and machine learning to identify classification criteria. The details of these criteria will be discussed and presented by Professor Jennifer Thorne right after my talk. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Manabu, for all your work along all these years about IHOS criteria for sarcoidosis that we all have been following. With this, we now know that Sun has come up after 10 years of hard work with criteria for different diseases, including sarcoidosis. And it's my proud privilege to invite Dr. Jennifer Thorne, uh, who is an integral part of the Sun Working Group. And she will be discussing about the diagnostic criteria given in Sun 2 about sarcoidosis. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Vishali, and thank you, Manabu, for the, the introduction. Trying to share my slides here. Hopefully, they will come up. There yeah. we go. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize a little bit about what the standardization of uveitis nomenclature working group has done uh, relative to ocular sarcoidosis. Um, my disclosures are here, but they are not related to this talk. Um, as most people would know, um, uveitis can be a challenging field because it represents a variety of diseases and um, they are um, have their own features, courses, prognosis. Uh, and to have criteria that define them in a way that there is a consensus agreement can help us in terms of what we report in the literature, 
offers some degree of precision or defines a phenotype of some of these conditions that would allow for future understanding of the pathogenesis or for inclusion in tr clinical trials to make sure that you have a homogeneous set of, uh, of a particular uveitic syndrome. Sorry, it looks like my slides are not going forward. There they go. So Sun was uh, started in 2004. So it's been in existence now for 17 years, started with about 60 uveitis experts and has risen to 99 on last count. The first goal that Sun set out to accomplish was to attempt to develop some standardization of terminology grading and outcomes reporting uh, among uveitis specialists, and um, it was fairly successful. Uh, there were uh, several um, outcomes that received supermajority um, consensus approval, and, and those were subsequently published. The second but larger goal has been this development of classification criteria of the more common forms of, uh, of uveitic um, disease. Uh, we set a goal of about 28 diseases, um, and we were able to develop criteria for 25 of those diseases that have been recently published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, and sarcoidosis-associated uveitis was one of those. So the process was similar for each of um, the uveitides and was fairly extensive when you break it down into its parts. An informatics-based database was first designed with terminology that was agreed upon by uveitis experts and then cases were collected. Approximately 7,000 cases were initially uh, uh, collected and culled including imaging on a substantial subset. These cases were then selected by an online voting process by uveitis experts. And then cases where there was not consensus were adjudicated by phone calls with uveitis uh, experts broken up into groups uh, addressing um, uveitis that were subcategorized by their primary anatomic location. Uh, the results of those selections and adjudications form the case database, the selected databases that were subjected to machine learning along the anatomic location of the disease entity. Um, so sarcoid was actually analyzed in all anatomic locations by anatomic location and then combined together for all cases of sarcoid associated uveitis irrespective of the anatomy. There were training and validation sets uh, that were developed. These were tested for misclassification rates as well as accuracy. There were sensitivity analyses. So if there were certain variables of interest or uh, wanting to look at um, the regions in which the, the cases were collected to see if there were any if there was any uh, variability within selected um, um, uh, testing results or selected regional locations, these were accounted for uh, with feature engineering. Uh, once we developed tables and we had misclassification rates, draft manuscripts were uh, produced and they were vetted by UBI the uveitis experts that uh, were in each group. So the and uh, the anterior uveitis group have reviewed all the manuscripts having to do with the diseases in, in uh, anterior uveitis. And then there was a uh, large group meeting where all manuscripts were reviewed again before they were submitted for uh, peer review. So within the sarcoid uh, subset of uveitis, Selected features that were identified from 278 selected cases of anterior, intermediate, posterior, and panuveitis associated with sarcoidosis. The features that uh, fell out were compatible uveitic syndrome of any anatomic uh, type and evidence of systemic sarcoid that was represented either as the presence of non caseated granuloma 
uh, uh, seen on a biopsy or the presence of bilateral hyaluradenopathy seen on chest imaging. And the accuracy of the validation set was actually quite high. It's listed here 99.7% with a very tight 95% uh, confidence interval. The misclassification rates uh, varied between 1.2% for pan-uveitis and 3.2% for anterior uveitis within the training set. But then the validation set that was rerun uh, the misclassification yielded no cases in anterior, intermediate, and pan uveitis. Now, you may wonder why I didn't list posterior uveitis. Well, there were 12 confirmed cases of posterior uveitis related to sarcoidosis. And so we weren't able to have the enough meaningful numbers um, to uh, run misclassification. So they were rolled into the pan uveitis. So just a little bit about classification criteria versus diagnostic criteria. Uh, since um, we also have diagnostic criteria with um, IWAS that Manuba just um, summarized so um, brilliantly for us. Um, classification criteria are meant for research purposes, um, but they can be, these, these two types of criteria can be similar and there can be overlap. And as you perhaps revise your classification criteria based on what you learn, um, it, it's possible to increase the sensitivity of the classification criteria, which will bring them into closer line with diagnostic criteria. Um, I list here some of the differences between the two types of criteria, but I wanna highlight the last two under classification criteria. And that is, is that there's less need for a gold standard and that these criteria can be driven by consensus. And in fact, these are one of, two of the main reasons why Sun chose to, uh, to design classification criteria because with the diagnosis of uveitis, we often do not have a gold standard. And in fact, a lot of our decision-making in terms of what makes a case of sarcoid-related uveitis, a case of sarcoid-related uveitis is group consensus from key international experts. So our goals have been to try to define the area under a bell curve, if you could imagine that. So we're looking for a group of homogeneous um, patients with the disease, in this case, sarcoid-related uveitis. In doing so, we may sacrifice some of the rarer presentations of the disease. So those would be the tails. Um, but our goal is, is to make sure that we don't diagnose or we don't classify a case of uveitis as sarcoid-related uveitis that in fact is not one, which means that your goal is, is to favor or increase your specificity over your sensitivity. So do they perform differently over time? Of course they do. One of the advantages is, is that classification criteria tend to be broader and they can, uh, um, they can inco incorporate um, patients with the disease throughout different regions of the world. But the goal ultimately is to perform research, learn more things about the disease, perhaps identify certain clinical surrogates or Im imaging surrogates that would help you uh, refine your criteria, revise them and continue to repeat the process. Ultimately, your classification criteria beginning to um, approximate diagnostic criteria. And in fact, we've seen a case of this uh, or an example of this in the SUN process where we looked at um, agreement between experts over time, including regional and um, variability. Um, and we noticed that even though we had reasonable uh, agreement um, and moderate kappas, uh, with individual graders of these cases, uh, we reached super majority agreement uh, in 96% of the cases or greater when we put our heads together and, and did this collaboratively. So 
classification criteria in some ways beget more learning process and improvement over time. So these criteria for sarcoidosis associated uveitis, they appear to have a very low misclassification rate and high accuracy. And although they may be used for clinical care and teaching, they're really more designed for research uh, because there isn't a gold standard. Um, they differ for the diagnostic criteria, and as the disease becomes better defined, we hope that we'll be able to refine the criteria and that they will approach diagnostic criteria. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Jen, for making the SAN criteria very, very clear to us. And I'm sure it's going to be very useful uh, for everyone to use all across the globe. Thanks. And with this, now we move on to Deborah. And Deborah Goldstein is going to tell us about the differential diagnosis of ocular sarcoma. Thank you. I'm really happy to be a part of this. Um, there's, as we've already heard so far, um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever, whatever time it is where you are, there are a lot of things that can look like sarcoidosis. So I'm just going to present cases of a few different things. This is not an exhaustive list. So our first case is a 67-year-old male who was referred to me with a diagnosis of bilateral uveitis, and the referral said, I don't know if this is sarcoid or birdshot. Visual acuity was 20-20 in each eye. He had no AC cells, no KP, no vitreous cells, no vasculitis, no CME. And this is the picture of what we see. And you could see how this could be thought of as maybe being birdshot. We see this choroidal infiltrate radiating from the nerve. In fact, this was a really easy diagnosis. I didn't have to do a whole lot. He already had a known diagnosis of systemic B-cell lymphoma. And so this is B-cell lymphoma uh, metastatic to the choroid. We have different forms of choroidal lymphoma, and both of these may mimic certain features of sarcoidosis. So disseminated systemic lymphoma tends to be bilateral. Again, no CME, no vasculitis, no vitreous cells. So not the inflammatory disease that we see with sarcoid. And these we treat the systemic uh, lymphoma plus or minus a local therapy. And actually what I see more commonly is primary choroidal lymphoma. This is a malt cell lymphoma variant, typically unilateral, very slow growing. And we tend to watch these patients. So you can see in this photograph um, on the bottom of the screen that there are these choroidal infiltrates. Certainly sarcoidosis can look like this. So choroidal lymphoma in the differential of posterior segment involvement with sarcoid. Our second case is a 42-year-old woman with uh, systemic sarcoidosis. This is biopsy proven from the lung. She also has hepatic disease. She's being well-managed um, systemically on um, methotrexate and low-dose oral prednisone, but she develops anterior uveitis in her right eye, and it's not responding well to topical corticosteroids and two different drops for her glaucoma. And here's a picture of what we see on the cornea. There are these large pigmented granulomatous KP, and despite the use of two different uh, antiocular hypertensive, her pressure is still 34 in that eye. And if we look really carefully, we could see that there were subtle iris transillumination defects. So this is a patient with known biopsy proven sarcoidosis who has herpetic anterior uveitis. Herpetic anterior uveitis, typically unilateral, um, ocular hypertension. They may or may not have signs of corneal disease. And the reason that this is in the differential for sarcoid is for the anterior segment disease in contrast to the lymphoma that I showed you with posterior segment. So this is a patient with granulomatous KP and anterior chamber cells. They can get posterior synechia, they can get PAS. So here is a patient with biopsy proven sarcoid with another cause for her uveitis. Um, herpes. So we have to remember the infectious causes of uveitis, even in patients with known non-infectious disease. So we always learned in medical school, OCAM's razor, make everything one disease. But the flip side of that is Hickam's dictum, which is a patient can have as many diseases as he pleases. So herpetic anterior uveitis, often granulomatous, can mimic sarcoid anterior uveitis. Our third case is a seven-year-old girl. She's had skin rashes since she was about two years old. 
arthritis diagnosed at age three, and uveitis picked up on screening at age five. Her ANA is negative, she has normal chest imaging, and she's really not responding well to methotrexate and adalimumab, granulomatous KP in both eyes, anterior chamber cells in both eyes, and you could see these really dramatic choroidal granulomas on her fundus exam. This is a child with Blau syndrome, autosomal dominant, uh, NOD2 card 15 mutation. It's a granulomatous disease that can look like sarcoidosis, lung disease in contrast to sarcoid where lung disease is super common, lung disease in the Blau patients is vanishingly rare. Our fourth case is an 84 year old woman who had come from India two weeks previously to see her son. She has decreased vision and redness in her left eye for two weeks. Best corrected visual acuity is a little decreased in the right eye and very decreased in the left eye. She has granulomatous KP in both eyes, four plus anterior chamber cells in both, both eyes, kepi and dusaka nodules. You can see on this photo of the right eye that she has large choroidal uh, granulomas and the left eye actually has a very large detachment. Um, just to show you the OCT, showing you the very dramatic choroidal infiltrate in the right eye with some subretinal fluid. Ooh, look at this. You get to see my whole thing. I didn't realize I put this many pictures in. Okay, so workup. She's PPD negative. ACE is elevated, chest x-ray is normal, syphilis testing is negative. So is this sarcoid? Is this VKH? Well, it was hard for me to believe that an 84-year-old who lived her entire life in India had never met tuberculosis, and I assumed that the negative PPD was due to energy, and in fact, her quantiferon gold was positive. So it's important to remember both TB and sarcoid can present with granulomatous uveitis, multifocal choroiditis, and you'll hear a whole talk on TB in the differential of sarcoid, but it's really, really important the diagnostic criteria for sarcoid include that we need to rule out other infectious or rule out infectious diseases, number one of which is tuberculosis. And our um, fifth case is a 36 year old um, African American woman with bilateral granulomatous enteruveitis and multifocal choroiditis. And you can see on this photograph, she's got these big, juicy, giant busaca nodules, some kepi nodules. On gonioscopy, you can see that there is an iris granuloma on gonio, and she has extensive PAS, and um, some of these do appear tent-shaped. And here's her fundus exam. She's got scars of old multifocal choroiditis. So large kepi and busaca nodules, it's bilateral. She has nodules in the angle. She has extensive tent-shaped tent PAS. She has scars of multifocal choroiditis. This is like all the IWAS criteria for the ocular manifestations of sarcoid. ACE and lysozyme are normal. FTA is non-reactive. Quantiferon is negative. CT chest is normal. And her review of systems is completely negative. So I, this to me looks like sarcoid. I am sure this is sarcoid. I have nothing to biopsy. She doesn't have conch granulomas. So this is idiopathic granulomatous panuveitis that sure looks like sarcoidosis. So sarcoid typically presents as granulomatous disease. Anterior segment granulomatous disease, you can have herpetic disease mimicking sarcoidosis, um, posterior disease or, or panuveitis, tuberculosis number one. We have to think about genetic causes, um, syphilis in the differential of absolutely everything, and then idiopathic disease, um, like in my last case that I'm really sure is sarcoid. And I'm gonna, for the once in my life, actually end on time. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for showing those such beautiful cases. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed. So with this, we now move on to Manfred, and Manfred is going to talk on drug-induced sarcoidosis. Over to you, Manfred. So thanks very much for allowing me to uh, to show you this a little bit rare, I think, thing regarding sarcoidosis. Well, drug-induced sarcoid uveitis, this is a classical uh, immune-related adverse event. 
um, you will get a little bit about biologics from me. And you know, these are highly effective drugs, quickly effective. They are wonderful drugs against inflammatory disorders like uveitis, like Bechet's disease, like sarcoidosis, psoriasis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will show you that some of these diseases can also start under uh, TNF alpha blocking agents. Well, this is an older um, slide from 2010 from a Spanish group, and they looked for, let me get rid of this one. Manfred, you are muted. We can't hear you. Manfred, Sorry. please. And, okay, perfect. So again, this is a uh, publication from 2010, selecting 800 cases with uh, autoimmune diseases induced by biologics. You have two types, systemic autoimmune diseases. Here you see sarcoidosis and then organ specific autoimmune diseases. Here you also have um, I think inflammatory ocular disease without naming exactly what these 87 patients have. The good point is there's a complete resolution after cessation of 72%. And that's something we also found. Um, there are only some case reports about sarcoid uveitis induced by biologics. So this is a publication of, I think, seven or eight centers uh, from all around the world. And the idea of this was to find uh, patients which developed a new onset of uveitis with 11 patients. Four of them finally had complete sarcoidosis. And the second group were these new recurrences under biologic. These were five patients. One of them had uh, also proven sarcoidosis. So um, the idea is to check if you have a uveitis under treatment, if this is a new onset, that means if the uveitis fits to your basic disease, or if you have a recurrence, despite treatment, that means despite treatment, if still is this the original pattern which you treated. So for example, if you have a patient with ankylosing spondylitis getting uh, under treatment with TNF alpha blocking agents, uh, this is a very typical pattern, the associated acute anterior uveitis. And if you see that pattern, this is really suggestive for recurrence. On the other side, atypical patterns would be bilaterality, for example, in ankylosing spondylitis uh, associated AAU, when this turns to be bilateral. Or if you have a new pattern, intermediate uveitis in JIA patients or ankylosing spondylitis associated anterior uveitis or even in Bechet, there is no idea of intermediate uveitis in Bechet. If you see granulomatous precipitates in ankylosing spondylitis or even multifocal choreotinitis, this is also nothing which belongs to ankylosing spondylitis. So this is a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. He had no uveitis before. Then under etanercept, he developed bilateral granulomatous anterior uveitis and the CT showed sarcoidosis. Um, that's another patient with ankylosing spondylitis, with typical AAU before. Then under adalimumab, he developed penuveitis and the CT showed bihila lymphadenopathy. So let's go through this. Uh, this mm, this huge picture here. Um, let's think you have a uveitis which develops under biologic treatment. That could be the first time. Then you have to check if this is clinical adequate to the associated systemic disorder. If yes, then it's probably the first uveitis despite your biologics. If no, you have to think about sarcoidose-induced uveitis. Something, the second one is recurrence of existing uveitis. Then again, you check if it's clinically identical to the previous uveitis types regarding anatomic localization, granulomatous versus non-granulomatous, and unilaterality versus bilateral. If 
It is. If it fits to the previous uveitis type, then it's probably recurrence despite biologics. And then you have probably to check if there are any autoantibody formations and you may switch the biologics. If this pattern is different, then there, you may have a change in atomic localization as shown before, change in laterality, change in galometers versus non galometers Then these are signs suggestive of sarcoid-like uveitis. And then you can go uh, to see if you, um, if you see such signs. I would suggest to do all these classical testing we have heard about to find a systemic um, signs of sarcoidosis. And if you find signs, then it may be positive for sarcoidosis. In that regard, it may be a drug-induced uveitis sarcoidosis. We would suggest to start at first with topical or systemic corticosteroids, depending on the, on the location of your uveitis. If there is a worsening, we definitely would change or stop the biologics. If there is an improvement, which is most of the cases, happened in most of our cases, then we would suggest a slow reduction. So testing for uh, uveitis in our five patients, um, this is, was a retrospective study. So not all of these patients who developed some, some of these pictures had been tested completely, unfortunately. Um, in five patients, we found a lung adenosy and one patient was biopsy proven. Look at this, he had rheumatoid arthritis and now he developed intermediate uveitis. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is never associated with any type of uveitis. So this is really a classical situation. So when it comes to drug-induced uveitis, there are some drug groups which can induce this. Immune checkpoint inhibitors, highly active antiretroviral therapy, interference alpha and beta, and then also the anti-TNF alpha drugs and some other monoclonal drugs. We found these patients in these cases in etanacept patients mostly, adalimumab also quite often, occasionally golidimumab, abatacept, and also infliximab. But physiologically, I cannot tell you too much. We guess there's a local or systemic cytokine imbalance. Um, interestingly, at a, uh, we found most of the cases with new uh, uveitis cases, with eight new cases in etanacept, only one recurrence. No one which knew uveitis in adalimumab, but three with a recurrence. Why etanacept? Um, well, we are not so sure. There is an upregulation of T cells known in etanacept, and it's interesting, also ineffective in granulomatous disorders like Crohn's disease, but it's probably more a class effect. And there seem to be also some genetic factors. There seem to be an interferon polymorphism, whatever this means in such situations. The treatment, interestingly, we got information about the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, if under this treatment you develop immune uh, related adverse events, then this was predictive for a better clinical response. So it's a little bit like anti-COVID vaccination. If you feel something regularly, classical uh, response after your vaccination, then this is a sign that there is something going on. And that seems a little bit going on also in at least the immune checkpoint inhibitors because melanoma patients with epilimumab studies with high uh, rate of uh, immune-related adverse events, they show a longer overall survival. So in biologics, we would probably add steroids first. And if this is not really effective, then we would replace our biologic. So in conclusion, there are various drugs which seem to induce sarcoid uveitis. It could be uveitis as first manifestation, or it could be uveitis as a recurrence. As I've shown you on this flow chart, I think it's very critical and important to differentiate this. Um, check the pattern of your uveitis, the clinic, and then, of course, also the lab findings and uh, chest CT will show you then finally if there is a sarcoid or not. Um, pathophysiologically, there may be a cytokine imbalance, but there are definitely other factors. Treatment, we would suggest first to add steroids and then change to biologics if there's nothing else available and there's nothing, no improvement. 
So with this last slide, I send you our summer autumn greetings from my city Tübingen. Thanks for attention. Thank you, Manfred, for very interesting and the new aspect of sarcoidosis. So with this, now we move on to Dr. Rupesh Agarwal from Singapore, who will be talking on differentiating TB from sarcoid. And I guess there's a lot of interest because already a few questions dealing with it. Over to you, Rupesh. Rupesh, we can't hear you yet. Sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, Professor Vishali, Professor Justine, and uh, Manfred and IUHG for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. I think uh, already uh, Deborah has uh, spoken about this very briefly in one of the cases, and a challenge has been given to me to differentiate uh, one of the type of granuloma, and you can see in this picture, and I'll be speaking about this picture uh, in detail when we go into this presentation. Some of the slides have been borrowed from Dr. Vishali's uh, presentation also, but let's start off with a case which I've been dealing with for last six years, happened to be one of my friend uh, who, has, who has seen probably some of the people on the audience also. And he's a 58 year old Indian national male with diabetes, hypertension, atypical chest pain, hyperlipidemia, he came to me with uh, floaters, places, and was diagnosed to as intermediate pubitis. So this is the uh, standard chart, which we use it in our clinics in Singapore. So this is the, in the peripheral retina. There were a lot of vitreous debris. Uh, there is uh, uh, both, both the eyes, and then there were retrodental cells, anterior chamber cells. So he was diagnosed to have intermediate uveitis, uh, underwent a standard workup, and eventually his TBT spot was positive. He was not very convinced. Uh, that he can have a TB, and he also underwent a TB20 ferron. Both were positive, and uh, he don't wanted to do a chest CT. Only chest X-ray itself was showing some densities in the right lower zone requiring further studies. So maybe later on, Professor Onmin Kwan can comment on this, about whether it is a TB or sarcoid. So my diagnosis here was TB-related intermediate uveitis, offered high resolution CT, but patient don't want it. Patient was, however, started on anti-TB medicines. So this is a long history. He has probably multiple follow-ups with me. I just want to cut this story short and uh, crystallize it into a few slides only. Like first presented at end of 2015 with bilateral intermediate uveitis. Had TB positive test, uh, chest X-ray positive, suggestive of TB, but uh, patient don't want it CT thorax, uh, not because of the pain capacity, but uh, he just don't want it to undergo the CT thorax. Just wanted topical steroids, so he was on topical steroids. Eventually, he developed cystoid macular edema. He wanted subtenance injection. He wanted intravitreal ozudex. He wanted even illuvian and all. But uh, then, eventually, he also developed shortness of breath in the meantime, for which eventually he went to respiratory physician and they did a chest CT. And this time, he was convinced he had bilateral pulmonary nodules with perilymphatic distribution. And they were thinking it can be sarcoidosis or it can be tuberculosis. Eventually, he went to SNEC seen by my colleagues, Professor Chi, who is on, uh, there and uh, some of the colleagues there. And he has earlier seen Dr. Biswas also in Chennai and was uh, eventually started on oral steroids and uh, whether the diagnosis of sarcoid or TB, one of those was made. So this is one of those standard challenging case where the diagnosis of TB was thought by uh, from the beginning and but eventually it turned out to be sarcoid. We still don't know whether it was a sarcoid to start with or whether it was a TB to start with. We don't know, and he's been seeing multiple. So I'm sure all of you must be seeing. So let's walk through some of the images which has been shared by Dr. Vishali also uh, in her presentation in different meetings. And uh, we will walk through some of the clinical signs. So it will be only images, uh, not uh, not much of theory part in this. So you can have APs, which was described by Dr. Manabu. And it will be interesting to see how does sun or any kind of a system creates these KPs of sarcoid versus TB. Can we differentiate really look at looking at the KPs and saying that, oh, this is sarcoid KPs and this is the TB KPs? Probably no. But these are the signs which was described by IWS, the criteria number two of presence of a tent like uh, peripheral anterior sinica on conioscopy. And this was picked up in one of the paper which we published in Sarcoidosis Journal that this is a really sensitive kind of a thing which was seen in uh, the work uh, done by uh, Carlos Fabricio's group 
and uh, they were able to show that uh, this is something which can be sensitive. You can also get a vascularized granuloma in the periphery in patients with the sarcoidosis. So uh, this can be some of those which can be uh, probably give you some clue whether you're dealing with a case of sarcoidosis. Now, when it comes to the intermediate uveitis, so you can have a string of pearls which can be there in TB or sarcoidosis. Here you can have the string, of, but we do know that uh, classical signs of the retinal that is how it has been described. But when it comes to the intermediate uveitis, I don't think there is anything specific for TB or sarcoidosis. As I was speaking about the retinal vasculitis, you can see presence of peripheral choroidal scars next to the para, uh, next to the veins like paravenous choroidal scar or CRA scars. You can probably think in the terms of TB, but if it is not there, then you are thinking more in terms of sarcoidosis, where you can have smaller nodules, which was shown by Dr. Tebra also, and with white or whitey yellow present in clusters. But again, this is all which can lead to the thinking about whether you're dealing with a case of sarcoid or dealing with a case of TB. Now, when it comes to choroidal granuloma or choroidal tubercles, those are again the small, small granuloma, most common intraocular presentation uh, in seen in 25 to 30% of pulmonary TB. But again, these are asymptomatic and it can be seen and need to be differentiated from sarcoidosis. Now, if it talks about the solitary granuloma with the serous RD, with the big granuloma, yellowish granuloma, you are thinking more in terms of TB rather than in terms of sarcoid. Once again, presence of optic disc granuloma is more pathognomonic towards sarcoidosis. You can see uh, optic disc granuloma with new vascularization of the disc, more suggestive of sarcoid rather than TB. Again, a retinal vasculitis in sarcoidosis, you do know that you can have, and not every time you are very lucky to get a classical picture like this. The picture will be quite uh, mixed up, but here it is a very classical picture with the skip lesions. So hope uh, medicine can give us some uh, certain clues like this, but not every time you are lucky to get a very clear cut picture like this. Again, bilaterality is more common in sarcoidosis. Right eye that was previously reported normal showed involvement, but again, when you see the bilateral cases, it is more common. And again, this is based on the literature. The again, a classical thing about the TB vasculitis, it is supposed to be the occlusive in nature, and you can see a significant occlusion, whereas as again the sarcoid, which is non-occlusive. Now, this is a paper by Anirudh, uh, and who will be speaking about one of the case, and a real uh, interesting paper by Anirudh and uh, the PGI group, and uh, I was fortunate to be part of that. But uh, again, based on the pictures, so here you can see the pictures on the top, it's a two-point scale grading of the fundus picture. You can see the, the lesions, how it is differentiated from the periphery or from the surrounding normal retina, and how these lesions are looking more yellowish. As against the lesions which are below, which are not so prominent, cannot be differentiated from the adjacent retina and are not so elevated. When it comes to the OCT, again, you can see how you can differentiate based on presence of this hyperreflective line, based on this presence of a large granuloma and based on the presence of subretinal fluid. And based on this, uh, sorry, this is the hyperreflective line and this is the description of uh, the RP uh, junction, RP Brooks membrane complex. Once again, this is more suggestive of TB rather than of the sarcoidosis. Let me clear all this. Okay. When it comes to the another OCT scan, you can see here this kind of a smallest granuloma with no disruption whatsoever and small tiny granuloma, which is more suggestive of sarcoid. You can have a bigger granuloma, but with only presence of subretinal fluid, but it did not have a presence of any kind of uh, underlying. Thing. Then you can have features on the FFA and ICG, but this is the ICG, which you can differentiate. The top one is the TB one, the below one is the, the sarcoid one. Not so prominent, not so very clear here. And again, you can see another picture, which can show a TB kind of a granuloma, which is more vascularized, as against the sarcoid, which is not so vascularized and more yellowish and more bulky vision on the TB. So you can have used imaging and a very nice work done by Anirudh on this thing. Now to summarize, Besides this, the imaging thing, the, it can be supported by positive tuberculin screen test, interferon gamma release assay, radiology can be helpful in detecting and some, of course, your microbiological diagnosis. On the other end, a diagnosis of sarcoidosis is supported by negative uh, screen test or negative IGRA with elevated serum A's or bilateral hemophilin on just CT. Sarcoidosis 
some newer diagnostic tools which we have just spoken in the previous talks about the CD4 CD8 ratios or vitreous lymphocytes can probably help us in achieving this. Just to give a thought about uh, this slide which uh, Justine has shown. Okay, sorry. Uh, about a concept which we have kind of proposed and one of the questions which Dr. Biswas asked in the, in the Q&A section as well is can the disease to two of these diseases coexist? Probably yes. And this is something a new classification or a new thought or a new concept which you wanted to propose and not something which is we have proposed for the first time. It's been lingering around and something we picked up from leprosy. You can have a pure form of sarcoidosis or a pure form of tuberculosis, but there can be a mixed form of sarcoid tuberculosis or tuberculous sarcoid. And depending on that, you can probably start the therapy. If it is a sarcoid, you can just give immunosuppression. If it is sarcoid tuberculosis, you can give immunosuppression with antitubercular therapy and same thing for tuberculous sarcoid. But if it is a TBTB, you can probably just give role of uh, only a TTB and maybe a very supplemental low dose steroid in case if it is needed. So probably we are heading towards this. We don't know. So to conclude, there is currently not so much of evidence. Imaging is helping us, but probably it will require a little bit more validation. Future research about the HLA of sarcoid to determine if HLA can be associated or can help us differentiate. In our context in Singapore, sarcoidosis is rare, where TB is more prevalent, and diagnosis of treatment of granulomatous infected uveitis is mostly TB driven rather than sarcoid, particularly in our context. Uh, but when we do see foreigners or migrants, uh, a population of sarcoidosis is diagnosed to be at the back of mind, especially if treatment wise. So, thank you very much for your patient listening, and thank you, IUHG, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Rupesh. Uh, now that we have discussed most of the aspects of diagnosis, uh, differentials, and differentiating it from other, we move on to uh, treatment uh, part. And with this, we have none other than Hiroshi Chakase, and it's my pleasure to invite you, Hiroshi to speak on current concepts in the diagnosis and management of ocular sarcoidosis, but he's going to deal more with the management aspects. Over to you, Hirosh. Hi, uh, thank you, Vishali. So uh, the topic I'm gonna talk today is a management of ocular sarcoidosis. So the management of sarcoidosis may be divided into two parts, that is medical therapy, for the intraocular inflammation and surgical therapy for ocular complications. So regarding the medical therapy, as one of the projects of the International Workshop on Ocular Sarcoidosis, a consensus workshop was conducted to establish experts' recommendations for management of ocular sarcoidosis. Questionnaires were sent to members of International Uveitis Study Group and International Ocular Inflammation Society, as many of you may remember, and 98 uveitis experts from 30 countries all over the world responded. So in the consensus workshop, statements of experts' recommendation based on the survey results were presented, discussed, and voted on by 10 international uh, expert panelists. Two third majority was taken as consensus agreement, and then recommendations for the management of ocular sarcoidosis was published from the British Journal of Ophthalmology last year. So the medical therapy presented today is based on these recommendations. So I would first show the drugs termed in the following presentation. The corticosteroid eye drops used here is prednisolone acetates 1% or similar, such as dictamethasone or betamethasone. Local corticosteroid involves subconjunctival dexamethasone injection, periocular triamcinolone injection, intravitreal triamcinolone injection, and steroid implant. Regarding systemic corticosteroid, initial recommended dose of dose of uh, steroid is 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram per day as prednisone or prednisolone to a maximum dose of 80 milligram per day. This maximum dose may differ according to the weight of the patient's body. For example, in Japan, 
the maximum dose is usually recommended to be 60 mg per day. That is much less. Mean duration of initial dose is recommended to be 2 to 4 weeks, and mean duration of total treatment is 3 to 6 months. Non-biologic corticosteroid sparing immunosuppressive drugs listed here are methotrexate, adathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, and cyclosporine. Intravenous pulse corticosteroid is considered in selected settings of severe disease, and biologic drugs, adalimab in this case, is used if necessary. So let's move on to the medical treatment that may differ according to the site, severity, and duration of the disease. So let me show you first the ocular manifestations that are indicators for treatment, then show you the recommended treatment. For anterior uveitis, anterior chamber cells, new onset KPs, iris nodules, iris uh, angle nodules, AC flare, new onset posterior synechia, and raised intraocular pressure are the indicators for treatment. In any case, the impact of visual acuity should be considered in decision. First-line therapy for severe anterior uveitis, that means AC cells equal to or more than 3 plus, or having new onset KPs or iris nodules, is corticosteroid eye drops at least 10 times per day. And second-line therapy is subconjunctival dexamethasone injection, periocular TA injection, or systemic steroid. For moderate anterior uveitis, that means AC cells less than 3 plus, first-line therapy is corticosteroid eye drops at least six times per day. And second-line therapy is frequent corticosteroid eye drops, subconjunctival dexamethasone injection, periocular TA injection, or systemic steroid. Inactive anterior uveitis does not require your treatment. That means steroid eye drops for prophylactic purpose is not recommended. For intermediate uveitis, diffuse vitreous opacities, snowball-like vitreous opacity, snow banks, and macular edema are the indicators for treatment. First-line therapy for active intermediate uveitis, regardless if it is bilateral or unilateral disease, is local corticosteroid and systemic corticosteroid. Second-line therapy is local corticosteroid, that is same as first-line, but non-biologic systemic immunosuppressants instead of systemic corticosteroids should be considered. For posterior uveitis, macular edema, optic disc nodules or granulomas, nodular or segmental peripheral bodies, active chorioretinal peripheral lesions, and choroidal nodules are the indicators for treatment. First-line therapy for posterior uveitis is systemic corticosteroid alone or with non-biologic immunosuppressants and local corticosteroids. Second-line therapy is same as first-line, but in this case, biologic drugs, adalimumab, is included for the treatment option. So this is a summary of the medical treatment. For anterior uveitis, start with frequent steroid eye drops, then use subconjunctival injection or periocular injection. In very severe case, systemic steroid can be also considered. For intermediate uveitis, start with local injection and systemic corticosteroid, then step up to non-biologic immunosuppressants. For posterior uveitis, start with the combination of systemic steroid, non-biologic immunosuppressant, and local corticosteroid, but adalimumab may be considered in severe posterior uveitis. So next, I would briefly talk about surgical therapy for ocular complications. 
The other complications indicated for surgical intervention are secondary cataract, secondary or steroid-induced glaucoma, persistent vitreous opacity, epiretinal membrane, persistent macular edema, and secondary macular hole. As for cataract surgery, corneal incision is basically recommended to preserve conjunctiva in case trabeculectomy is required in the future. Secondary cataract of ocular sarcoidosis is often complicated by posterior synechia and fibrin membrane formation on the surface of the lens. This is a case of cataract surgery for an eye with ocular sarcoidosis. The pupil cannot be opened by a microhook because there is an invisible membrane on the surface of the lens and iris. In such case, the membrane can be teared by using microforceps so that the microhook can open the pupil through the tear of the fibrin membrane. What is important to perform intraocular surgeries for ocular sarcoidosis is that complete remission of active inflammation should be achieved at least three months prior to surgery, if possible. But if surgery is needed for eyes with active inflammation or recurrence of inflammation is anticipated by surgery, subtenant injection of triamcinolone or temporal systemic steroids should be considered. On the other hand, vitrectomy is usually safe and effective even for eyes with active intraocular inflammation if intravitreal triamcinolone is used during surgery. So today I talked about management of ocular sarcoidosis. For medical treatment, I introduced the expert's recommendations for management of ocular sarcoidosis, including ocular manifestations that are indicators of treatment, first and second line treatment for anterior, intermediate, or posterior uveitis, and drugs used here. I also talked briefly about surgical interventions. What should be kept in mind is that complete remission of active inflammation should be achieved. Otherwise, perioperative STTA or oral steroid should be considered. So that is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hiroshi, for a very, very clear guidelines about management. So with this, I would pass on the thing to Dr. Professor Kwan. And everybody knows Kwan, he's from Stanford and very actively involved in the sarcoidosis research. So Kwan is going to discuss some clinical scenarios that will be presented. And uh, he's going to get the group discussion going. Over to you, Kwan. Yes. Uh Good evening, morning, afternoon to everyone. I, I would like to also thank many attendees who have stayed past midnight to join us. Uh, as you have seen thus far, ocular sarcoidosis can have multiple manifestation and it's very great for us to be able to learn from other experts. We could to start this case with a session with two cases from two different parts of the world. And I will have um, Dr. Wadaru Masumiya who is currently assistant professor of ophthalmology at Kobe University in Japan to present the first case. And again, as we have learned thus far, sarcoid can have very protein manifestation. So as we go to this, it would be great if we see where we could have detected the disease at, at the first moment. So with that, Wodaru, please go ahead with your case. Can, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So uh, I'm Wataru Matsumiya at Kobe University. I had been a visiting fellow at the Bayer Eye Institute at Stanford for the 18 months. Today, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present this challenging case. Today, uh, my presentation is titled as a case of the painless loss of vision in a man with coxtoidal men meningitis. 57 years old male had experienced persistent painless vision decline in the left eye since January of the 2019. 
Since diagnosis of the Cox steroidal meningitis two months later, he had kept taking posaconazole antifungal therapy. However, his visual symptom had not improved despite continuous antifungal therapy. Then he, he was referred to us in March 2020. Here is the history of the present illness. In January 2019, his vision was 2040 in the left eye, and optic nerve edema and chorioretinal infiltration were noticed at outside ophthalmologic clinic. At the same time, orbital MRI showed abnormal enhancement involving optic nerve and muscle in left orbital and trace enhancement in the light optic nerve. In addition, positive of coxioidal Im images antibody with low titer in CSF was noted as, a, as well. Then, given the evidence of the infection and the clinical findings, he was diagnosed as coxioidal meningitis. He started fluconazole first, then switched, switched to fosaconazole due to nausea. Repeated orbital MRI showed no remarkable change. In October 2019, orbital muscle biopsy showed granuloma inflammation with small non caseating granuloma. Given the possibility of non infectious ocular inflammation, he started oral steroid 60 mg in November 2019. During three months, steroid therapy, he had noticed improving visual acuity. However, when he, however, when he discontinued steroid due to running out of medication, he noticed again his vision loss in the left eye. In March 2020, he saw new neuro-ophthalmologist at Stanford. MRI still showed active enhancement in the left orbital. As sarcoidosis was suspected, he started prednisone 20 milligram again. Next month, he presented to Uveitis Clinic at Stanford. In clinical examination, his visual acuity was 2060 in the left eye. Anterior segments were almost normal except vitreous cell in the left eye. Negative or normal range of lab data were described at the bottom. Wide angle fundus photo show the chorioretinal atrophy around the optic disc and disc edema in the left eye as well. OCT showed that uh, diffuse, shows that ellipsoid zone was disrupted in the macula. There was no remarkable abnormal findings in the light eye. So FA fluorescein angiography showed moderate leakage from the optic disc and window defect on chorioretinal atrophy lesion in the left eye. He underwent FDG PET as an additional imaging for suspected, sar suspected sarcoidosis, which showed lymph nodes above and below the diaphragm. It was consistent with active sarcoidosis. In this case, neurosarcoidosis was strongly supported by ocular findings, MRI, PET-CT, and non case eating granuloma test, granuloma from the muscle biopsy. However, it was hard to deny the potential contribution of the coxioidal infection in this case. Therefore, he started treatment, uh, even treatment initially with antifungal therapy. Here we can see the summary of the clinical course in this case. He started oral steroid therapy after three days of the steroid infusion therapy. Antifungal therapy was discontinued three months later. Flare up of the neurologic symptom was noticed, noted in December 2020. Then, systemic steroid was restarted and monthly infliximab infusion was started. The bottom graph shows a mild deterioration of the visual acuity in both eyes due to the cataract. Then, he underwent cataract surgery in both eyes in the recent months. Finally, his vision improved to 2020 in the right eye and 2040 in the left eye. Here is the clinical part. 
Today, I presented a case of the neurosarcoidosis, which masqueraded initially as Cox joidal meningitis. However, given the clinical cause in this case, perhaps this case may support the hypothesis that there is association between the sarcoidosis and coccygeoidal infection. FDG PET is a useful tool to diagnose sarcoidosis. Coccygeoidal infection, which uh, coccygeoidal infection is an important entity in the differential diagnosis of ocular sarcoidosis. Infliximab may be a potential therapy for a case with refractive sar refractory sarcoidosis. I had the opportunity to manage this patient while I was working with Dr. Gwen at the Biles Eye Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Waduru, for that. Uh, very that, and as uh, we can see, the case was quite complex. Uh, we are going to have now our uh, second presenter for a second case, and then we can discuss both cases together. So the second presenter just today is Dr. Aniruddha Agarwal, and we have heard his name already today. He's currently Associate Physician Consultant at the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. However, he has been on a faculty, has been under tutorship of Dr. Vishali Gupta, as well as Dr. Rupesh Agarwal, and Aniruddha has contributed greatly to the field. And now he can present the second case. Um, hello, greetings from Abu Dhabi, and thank you to IUSG. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wen, for this opportunity to present a challenging case of pediatric uveitis. This is a patient that I had managed uh, as a faculty at PGI Chandigarh uh, with the Department of Pediatrics uh, involved in the care of this patient. As you can see, this patient is a young boy, uh, 11 uh, and a half years old, who presented with fever. Uh, the latest episode was lasted, uh, lasting for almost eight months, and the boy had multiple joint pains and swellings and shortness of breath for five days. And this is an acute presentation in the Department of Pediatrics. Now, the patient had fever, which was high grade, and it came with chills with a maximum of 103 to 104. And the joint symptoms were actually quite extensive. And you can see that they're not only involving the small joints, but also large joints of the hips and knees bilaterally and the lower back. The child also had dry cough and chest pain with pain increasing on deep breathing. So for all of this, this patient had already undergone a CT imaging of the chest and a bronchoscopy, and he was diagnosed to be uh, positive for TB on gene expert using a bronchoalveolar lavage, and at a different center was already started on antitubercular therapy. Now the fever resolved after the therapy was initiated, but the joint symptoms persisted. And the fever actually reappeared after a few days with worsening of the joint symptoms. At this point at a different center, the, th the regimen of antitubercular therapy was modified to include canamycin, cefazoline, and levofloxacin. So this is the clinical course. And you can see that this patient has really never improved much clinically from the point of view of joint symptoms. There was a break in the fever between the months of August and September, but despite modification of all treatments and addition of naproxen, this child did not do very well. He was subjected to re repeat imaging uh, at our center and we realized that this patient has multiple lymph nodes and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy on the CT imaging. And if you see this systemic examination was very significant for a swelling of bilateral wrist uh, small joints of the hands, ankles, knees, but there was no erythema, and with restriction of the joint movements uh, in, involving both these small and large joints. So at this point, the differentials that were considered were drug-resistant tuberculosis, uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, blouse syndromes, uh, and we've had a discussion in the question and answers on that, and sarcoidosis. At this point, we were consulted, and we realized that this child has really low vision of counter fingers in both the eyes, the intraocular pressures were within normal limits, and there was anterior chamber cells, flare, and anterior vitritis. We obtained the fundus photographs, and we realized that there is disc edema and significant vitritis. Uh, it's much more significant in the left eye, and what we don't have on the pictures is presence of retinal vasculitis, which was seen clinically in the left eye. Now, at this point, we co-managed this patient very closely with the Department of Pediatrics, and we realized that. If we needed an answer, we would want to do, we would want to isolate any organism like mycobacterium tuberculosis or simultaneously work up for other possibilities. Now, this time we also obtained the MONTU test, which was negative. 
And therefore, we thought to reconsider the diagnosis of TB and we said, could it be really sarcoidosis? We went ahead with endobronchial biopsy and we realized that there are granulomas in the endobronchial as well as transbronchial lung biopsies. And you can see that this child had non-caseating uh, granulomas without acid fast bacilli on both the endobronchial and transbronchial lung biopsies. We can see that there is no caseation in the center and this led us to the diagnosis of sarcoidosis and made tuberculosis much lower down in the list given the, no, uh, the absence of caseation and central necrosis. So this patient was initiated on steroids for the first time. All this while he was not given steroids for the fear of drug resistant tuberculosis. And you can realize that this child uh, dramatically improved significantly clinically with a weight gain of about four kgs in one month. And his visual equity improved to 2080 uh, in both eyes from counting fingers. And you can see there is residual dyskedema in the left eye, but the vitritis has completely resolved uh, in both the eyes with, the, with one month of corticosteroid therapy. How were the other conditions ruled out? And I think this is the crux uh, and probably Dr. Wen will carry on this discussion. We did not have any evidence of AFD or any culture, so we really could not rule out drug resistant TB. Although we have learned now uh, that TB and sarcoid can coexist or be a part of the spectrum. Because of the significant pulmonary involvement, juvenile idiopathic arthritis was ruled out and Blouse syndrome was ruled out because there is a significant pulmonary involvement in our patient, which is not seen in Blouse and Blouse usually comes with dermatitis. So again, I leave uh, the case with the question, can TB and sarcoid coexist? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Anurua. Uh, we will have now to open up some question to both cases, but we can see these cases were quite complex, thought out with the systemic mutation that led to something the diagnosis of this. So uh, Dr. Gupta, any comment from you on these cases? Uh, you know, Kwan, the first case, when we look in retrospect, it looks like neurosarcoid, but then all, all of us are very wise in retrospect. But I agree with you, the moment you have even a slightest suspicion of fungus, especially like yes. for us in the COVID era, it's always safer to cover it with antifungal drugs. So I absolutely agree with the management plan that was given. Uh, Jennifer, anything coming from you, Dr. Thorn? No, nothing additional, Quan. It's an interesting case, though. Thank you. Yes, and Rubesh, uh, you have discussed about the uh, difference between uh, TB as well at Salkoi here. And so the case that Anmi would present, uh, what are your thoughts? Hello, thanks. I think it was a very good case. And as uh, Anirudh uh, mentioned in his concluding slide about uh, can TB and sarcoid coexist and all. I think that this is always a dilemma and we really do not know. And my question or my challenge is how much we can investigate. So here we were fortunate to investigate this patient, but if it was not so much of investigation, I would be probably thinking more in terms of sarcoid, giving him TB, uh, the treatment with the steroids. And, uh, uh, but here we were fortunate to get a biopsy done, which was non caseating and that, that kind of clinched us, it is more of a sarcoid sarcoidosis kind of a thing rather than of a sarcoid tuberculosis or this. But this was probably at one end of the spectrum as we spoken about. Yeah, those are some of the thoughts. But yes. again, this is always a challenge and it will all depend on how the case evolves. May not be at the same time the diagnosis can be achieved, but probably need to revisit the diagnosis in six months and one year, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Rupesh. Uh, this particular patient, like there was this fear of drug-resistant tuberculosis uh, because he came with diagnosis of drug-resistant tuberculosis. You know, so like Anirudh has shown, when I was looking at this presentation today, I said, oh my God, this was sarcoid to begin with. But like... That's correct. your case, you know? Yes. Physician says it could be drug related tuberculosis. We still do not have that convincing phenotype in the eye that we can say nobody, it's sarcoid, you know. 
we still are we still depend on them for few of the things and you want to play safe because biologics are intravenous steroids in case of tuberculosis could cost him life as well so we you know that was the question here Quan, yes, thank you can we, can we can limit always this can we limit the uh, discussion here for one or two minutes now so that we have really also a little bit time for the last point for the controversy? Can I quickly add my comment to both cases? And that's the question also to Onmin. Um, how typical is such a second case of the child for active TB? Because for us, it's super typical uh, with joint problems and fever of uh, pediatric sarcoidosis. What about TB? Do you see these cases as TB cases in India? With arthritis and fever? You're asking on me, I don't see him. Um, yeah, yeah, actually Dr. Khan I, is here. So I was gonna ask him too. Go ahead, Dr. Khan. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, you, you do get these kind of systemic, more generalized syndromes, but actually one thing that we should also remember, we, we recognize in TB as we treat patients, there's about a 15%, if not larger proportion of people who get what we call paradoxical reactions. And this crossover to a sarcoid-like phenotype is probably part of it. And ironically, that group, we give infliximab, my, you know, and things like Montelicast, et cetera. So I, I can't specifically answer what it looks like in India in terms of pediatric practice, but um, in the UK, that second case, we would have potentially labeled is the paradoxical reaction. As I say, the, the kind of crossover to the TB sarcoid phenotype. That's a really interesting uh, conversation, but most TB physicians recognize a paradoxical reaction on treatment two to three months in potentially. Well, I think the question is here, um, how important it is to show that there is a systemic sarcoidosis I think that turns also into the controversy. My question is definitely, should we have criteria which do not need lung involvement in sarcoidosis? I think that's not a new problem. And this is not a problem of sarcoidosis. It's also, of course, the same problem in tuberculosis. But that would really help a lot of our patients. You saw the frustration of Debra in this case. This for me also is clearly ocular sarcoidosis. Yeah. I think you can keep cool and tell if this looks like sarcoid and I cannot prove it, let's treat him like sarcoid and that will probably solve all the problems. And yes. his bronchioalveolar lavage was gene expert positive for tuberculosis, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, unfortunately, that history cannot be ignored. Yeah, so that's, that's the I problem. Mean, have a gene expert positive. You can't tell them that, you know, just give steroids because I think it is that one. Mm. This was I not about so this people, case. Of course not. Sorry. Yeah, I think so. This was more general. Quite, are quite difficult. I mean, like Vishali say, when you actually involve inside a case, it's very difficult. And now we look back, thing may look a little bit easier, but when you involve with that case, just like the case we present with the, uh, the coxial infections. Uh, but Manfred brought a good point and that is, I, I, I believe that all of us agree that, the, that we do consider an entity of ocular sarcoi. And in the literature, it's reported that ocular sarcoi can be presented at maybe three to 5% at the initial presentation when systemic sarcoid has not been detected yet. So I do believe that there is this entity that may be just limited to the eye first before it's involved the other organs. With that. Well, it's similar to vitreoretinal lymphoma. It all depends on the quality of your detection methods. If you use the most sophisticated, let's call it simply um, a PET CT scan. If you could use a PET CT scan in all of these patients, then you find much more your way to the correct diagnosis. But uh, I'm not so sure who presented PET. I think Aniruta, you presented the PET patient. This was with PET. What did you yeah, this was easy to do, PET, in your countries, in such uh, situations? Yes, we, well, we have the major university settings, so yeah, that was not difficult. I mean, we have to arrange, but yes, <laughs> and that was is available. Yeah. So that has to be a next step, yes? If you really want to find out if this 
to make the best diagnosis possible, then you really have to go to the PET CT scan. I think this is mm -hmm. also very important for TB, definitely, and that's also the, for some others like vitreoretinal lymphoma. But in the same, and I, I hope that Onmin can ac accept this one, it's not acceptable to check only the lungs. For tuberculosis and uh, sarcoidosis, it's always the same. Uh, Onmin presented very nicely the, um, the situation of sarcoid in different organs. So what if the lungs don't show anything? Lung TB is all the same, yes, in this situation. The lungs don't show what you're looking for, but you missed finding some, some renal involvement. So it should be definitely... Uh, a part of, I don't know, meeting, publication or something like that, how to do the correct diagnosis. And this is not simply due to chest x-ray, even chest CT. Don't limit everything to the chest if you really want to find out if this is TB or sarcoidosis. Yeah, I completely yeah, agree. Like uh, the pet, uh, yeah, pet's superior in many respects. Yeah. And well, especially really because you see the whole body. Yes. Yeah. Helps. Actually, the, <laughs> the Department of Radiology at Stanford uh, no longer recommend, for example, that we do gallium scan, which when we grow yes. up, that's what we do. They say that it's no longer as effective. So whenever we order gallium scan now, they automatically say that please consider PEP CT as we discuss. Uh, so I think at this moment, we can end here so that Manfred can uh, finish during the next session on the controversy aspects. So well, we are table. already in the middle of the controversy. Yeah, this is the middle of the discussion already. So, <laughs> so thanks very much to these two <laughs> beautiful case reports. They show mm. exactly how important it is to have some kind of controversy. Again, this is only about things which are not absolutely nicely published, yes? This is some kind of brainwash. Let's find out how is the future of these diseases. And I see the similarity. You know, it's not just that TB... Uh, has no sarcoid follows TB. They are both so similar, yes, that we had to put them together. I think this is absolutely necessary. Whenever we talk here about sarcoid, I think we surely will think about, well, let's call it better TB. It's the same effect. So again, very important. Um, in TB, we have the numbers. 80% of ocular TB uh, do not affect the lungs. So what's going on here? Should we wait? with effective treatment until our lung specialists uh, also agree that this needs anti-TB treatment because there's a touch of uh, TB seen in the lungs, or should we work on the situation that we have some own uh, criteria? And that's the same in sarcoidosis. Do we have any numbers, ocular sarcoidosis without uh, findings in the lung? So um, we, we have a kind of London-wide collaboration looking at PET in this very issue, Manfred, and it will hopefully be submitted for publication in the next six months. But basically, if you use PET alone, that will give you a 70% coalescence of ocular phenotype, and we agreed what those three phenotypes would have been, versus a PET signal. And... Um, the, the commonest side is intrapulmonary adenopathy, which can be normal size. If you do a CT scan, it will look completely normal, but the PET will show that there is activity within the mediastinal nodes. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there are proportional people just with mediastinal um, cervical nodes or intra-abdominal nodes, but adenopathy is probably the commonest phenotype we'll see with PET, but there's a you know really hidden population. If you just did CT scans, you will miss this. So, um, I mean, I, I kind of agree, but what I'm saying is intrapulmonary adenopathy, technically speaking, is not the same as pulmonary parenchymal. So mm -hmm. same compartment, but different disease. So I see two points. The first is that we should go on with our suggestions about diagnostics, not stop with chest X-ray. Everyone knows that one. Chest CT is number one, but then go to PET CT scan. The idea of this one is not to overlook involvement of sarcoid of any other organs. I think this is a very, very important thing. This is not in too many patients, Vishali. Yeah, on men, like on PET, like ocular, you are not sure whether it is TBR sarcoid. So now Sun says that if you see hyalur lymph nodes, think of sarcoid always are the other criteria. Now, suppose I get a PET done and PET shows some mesenteric lymph nodes. 
Now I'm looking at those lymph nodes without biopsy. Can I say it's TBR sarcoid? So I, I think this is the bit that needs refinement. And I think, you know, it's a bit like a CT. If I go back to the CT and the PET um, analogy, there's a CT scan that's BHL, but there's a BHL, which is different in TB versus sarcoid. So the experienced radiologist or respiratory physician will tell you that one looks like a sarcoid-like CT. That one, you, you, But if the report will say the same thing, it'll say BHL. But when you look into the parenchyma and the kind of fissural abnormalities, subtural nodularity, it's a world of difference to me. Um, so I think it's due to pattern recognition and how we describe that within a sudden context. I think that's really quite a big question and you need really very uh, defined parenchymal analysis as well as symmetry of nodes, et cetera. I think there's a way around it. What I'm saying is I think at this phase, we haven't done that um, type of depth of work to be able to tell you, but I, I bet you Vishali, we speak to your kind of experienced radiologists, they'll tell us sarcoid from a TB case in terms of pattern as opposed to just the descriptor of BHL. So I mean, again, would you suggest that if you have the results of a PET CT scan, you should do the biopsy? I, I would generally anyway, because if you miss a drug resistant organism, that you're in real trouble. <laughs> Yes. You know, you keep treating them, they'll be getting worse and you won't know whether to give them steroids or more um, broad spectrum anti-TV meds. So I, th I think in the same way that we want to know that they're non casating granulomas in a TB context, same spectrum, you've got to have a biopsy from my point of view. Now, the, the case management, I think that's interesting is let's say you've got a diagnosis of let's say TB made, but you think actually they have a sarcoid phenotype. Yes, you should give steroids at the same time. But the, the benefit of having samples is you know you're not dealing with a drug-resistant organism. Mm -hmm. So I would I sample. Think, uh, yeah. Professor Anupan, mm -hmm. might, might be a good uh, case for uh, application of AI for understanding the chest CT or this imaging pattern of TB versus sarcoid. I think it will be very, very important because our human eyes cannot pick up or if it is only picked up by a specific radiologist or highly trained. I think it is a very good case where some AI people can look into this and can probably differentiate. What yeah, potentially. Well, no, no, potentially, yes, because obviously, as I say, it, it's to do with the experience base and whether they see both. If what radiologist sees one type of phenotype, you're in trouble because they will always label it their common disease, okay? Yeah. So you want to work in an area that, ironically, I run as big a sarcoid clinic as I do a TB clinic, which is why I'm saying I, I can see these. I'll look at the scan and I'll tell you which one it is. I don't, you know, same same report comes out from the radiologist, but I'll tell you which one it is just purely by looking at the lung phenotype as well as the, the pattern of um, not nodes because I biopsy them all the time. I have that instant organic feedback. But AI is good, good idea. So we... Um... All of us have enjoyed ourselves very much and at major academic center, we have all this high-end test and biopsy and AI thing. But what about to the many colleagues who are practicing in area where they may not have all of this high-end testing? So what would the uh, panel's expert here feel that, what, what would be the highest yield but yet the lowest cost for many of the colleagues, maybe some of them on the line right now, who are practicing in an area where we just don't have all this fancy testing, we don't have AI and things. What do colleagues think that this is for sure? Vishali, please. Yeah, if you are confused between TB and sarcoid, you can just start treatment with steroids because unless you are seeing a large tuberculoma or abscess, TB is immune driven as well. So starting steroid and vision threatening after you have sent the reports for testing will not do any harm. Just do a simple PPD skin test. If PPD is positive, it's likely to be TB. If it is negative and your population is BCG vaccinated, think very seriously about sarcoid. In that event, you can continue to give steroids or whatever you are treating. But if TB tests come positive along the way, depending on whether you can afford X-ray, RCT, R PET, Quantiferon. If they come positive, just add ATT to it. That's it. That's the easiest way, I agree. So yeah, I, I think question. our time is. Manavu, yeah, you yeah. still have? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I have a question to the uh, professor Om Min Kam. Uh, you talk about the uh, imaging of the uh, lung, mostly, uh, such as the uh, CT scan or PET. I wonder, are there any systemic or laboratory tests good for diagnosis of uh, sarcoidosis from viewpoint of the pulmonologist? Uh, you know, the new novel laboratory test, which may be helpful for, for the diagnosis of the sarcoidosis. So as, as you know, there are a lot of now emerging papers on things like transcriptomics as well. So I think, again, this is obviously a very kind of high cost approach. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to get immune signals that differentiate one from the other so far. Mm -hmm. In fact, that signal cross over Cross, crosses over substantively, oh. so we don't have enough. We don't have a magic. <laughs> yeah, so th this is the type of work I meant. If you start looking at cytokine profiles, or for that matter, um, transcriptomic signals of, mm. of pattern of inflammatory response. So I think those may well eventually kind of refine themselves, but I don't think we're there yet. And I mean, we talk about the ACE, by the way, as some kind of magic biomarker in sarcoid. I'm sure most of you. <laughs> Who do TB have seen raised serum ACEs in TB in a severe enough case. So I, I, th I think that is work coming, Manabu. I'm sure it will come. It's just we're still trying to refine it for TB. And then as part of that, sarcoid will follow. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I we're think there yet. We single cell there. RNA sequencing. I think the single cell RNA sequencing might be a good way to go forward, probably something to consider because it's really picking up the single cell RNA. Yeah. Okay, so I think we are over time. We have already uh, six minutes past five, five, my time here. It's much, much later in some of your countries. I'm aware of this one. I would like to thank you so much. This was a very, very informative, lovely meeting. All of you stayed perfect in time. Congratulations. That always makes this uh, organization much, much easier. Okay, um, for all participants, thanks very much that you joined us. Uh, can I repeat again? We are, the next meeting will be uh, in October, beginning of October, highly suggestive, this one. Uh, I think that will be another good one. But then before we go to the November, to the 11 to 20 meetings, we will have, we plan October 16 to have an extra meeting about COVID-19 and the eye. So please stay informed following up our, uh, our, e our emails. You will get an invitation for this one uh, and also our website. Uh, other side, on the other side, thanks very much for your attention. I would like to wish you a wonderful, uh, great uh, weekend. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So, bye, -bye. Do we still have a few questions? Just have two questions left. One is about serum calcium. Kwan, can you take that up about vitamin D and calcium? Yes, uh, I'd most have to be high calcium and they are to good protein. So uh, for the answer life here, we do follow this aspect and <clears throat> it's part of our work too, because as we know steroids are very effective treatment for sarcoid. So when we do this, we have already an understanding we may have to keep the patient on uh, steroid, even at low dose for a while. So we do want to check the level. And then if you feel like you have to keep them on long time, since the supplement with calcium and vitamin D are so um, in the general quite safe that we usually go ahead and, and maintain the patient on dose. Especially if you think that you're gonna need uh, even low dose uh, prednisone to maintain the disease-free status. Thank you, we are done. Okay, good. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. 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 I mean, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, my friend. Bye. Yeah, there's still. I'm okay. not so sure that thank you. That doesn't need anything. <laughs> and the other one, I don't. I mean, if pure posterior uveitis, I don't know what that means. There was something before, I think. And 
the one with Sarko does. I think Kwan is doing this one. Okay. Okay. Manabo, thanks so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> okay. <laughs>